To me, the lost thing is about finding belonging. Our main characters, Boy and LT, walk through this industrialised world, I guess in, in desperate search to find a place where colour can run free and imagination and ideas can explode and playfulness is encouraged. And so they march through this world where no one pays them any attention. I was quite fortunate to be brought onto this film relatively early. Already I'd been given a copy of the book and the first sequence was just about to be animated and so I already had quite a lot of stuff to play with and so my first instinct was sound collection. I knew that this was going to be a big project and that they were talking about 72 characters needing sounds in all these locations and so I attacked it in, in two parts. I got to know the book very intimately, the locations depicted in the book, because I knew that the adaptation was going to be quite close to the book. So it gave me an indication of the types of sounds I'd need. And so speaking with the Foley artist, Adrian Medhurst, he and I sort of deconstructed the characters and we thought about the different types of elements that the characters would need. So even before we had pictures, he was recording loads of wild sounds and going through props. because it was so sound effects dependent. I started laying in a lot of stuff and receiving a lot of Foley and trying to make that work, but so much of it sounded, I guess, so stark because of the nature of animation. There is no bed that was recorded on set. And so everything you laid in there has a very deliberate feel to it. And so I moved away from effects and started to think more about well, what does that world sound like and spent quite a lot of time labouring over different layers and thinking about transitions um, and, and having like an atmosphere from one scene moving into the next. So the whole thing worked as almost a musical composition. And with that in place, the tone was set. And so when we then added sound effects to that, they had a bed with which to sit in. Soon there was no denying the unhappy truth. It was lost. Working with Sean Tan was pretty awesome. He was really respectful of creative space and, and gave me quite a lot of license because it allowed me to really explore things because he was so curious to see, you know, what could be made and, and what was possible. And he would, you know, obviously throw in a lot of suggestions and get quite excited about things but he created a very defined boundary and that is this is a mechanical world, it's a steampunk world and this whole digital thing really doesn't exist. Um, I have a lost thing. I called the receptionist. Fill in the forms. She sighed. For the backgrounds of this film, I knew they needed to be constantly evolving and Sean spoke about this world that was so ordered and structured and clock ticking and marching and steam and so they needed to be washed out to a certain degree and distant and, and moving and grinding and, and mechanical. And the inner western suburbs of Melbourne has a whole bunch of refineries and factories and all sorts of late night industry constantly chugging through. And so the sound effects recordist, Bart B and I, ran around in the middle of the night pointing microphones at whatever steam blasts or generators or pipes or whatever we could find that made the types of sounds we were looking for. But the overall hum and tone, that washed out sound that you sort of hear throughout the film, and that was recorded um, from Williamstown Beach, which is kind of a small beach in the inner west. And if you point the mics at the shore, you get this incredible chorus of all of the factories in the area singing at the same time, which worked really well for the beach sequence. Hello?
When Michael Yazerski came on board as music composer, a lot of the sound design had already been put into place. And, you know, Sean started talking about different ways that they, we could use music to enhance different emotions in different scenes. And so a lot of the discussions surrounded the types of instruments that Michael was going to use in different scenes. And so I went through and revised a lot of the scenes that we had originally by taking out a lot of the bass frequencies if there were going to be like bass instruments coming through or vice versa so that each didn't clash on the other. What we'd hoped is that the audience member would never really be aware of sound versus music but be an audience member who was following the story and the emotional intent of the directors. My role as a sound mixer is to always take the elements that are presented to me, which uh, primarily fall into the three categories of dialogue, music and effects, and combine them in a way that tells the story. But the absolute refinement of the storytelling ought to happen at the edit. A good story is made in the edit. A good story is not made at the mix. I firmly believe that. What I love getting is, the, is get the tracks that come from the editor and I go, I understand the story. My job now is to refine each of those items and have a mix that will then have all of the balances, the relationship of dialogue to music and effects will survive through all of the media where the project will be seen and heard. During the Utopia sequence, which goes for about a minute and a half, we had over 30 characters that all needed individual sounds. And the real challenge was finding a balance where each character had a moment to make its sound and then depart the shot. And we found that by creating one defining sound for each of those characters, because their screen time was a matter of seconds, that was the best way that we could execute the entire thing and keep it moving. A really heartbreaking moment for me happened during the mix when a lot of the sound effects that we'd created for the Utopia sequence was replaced by the music. And I guess, for me, I guess it was the first time I'd ever experienced anything where, you know, you'd spent so much time developing something to then see it end up on the cutting room floor. But it wasn't until I heard a quote actually that night about a director who said that you need to be prepared to sacrifice your best shots to make your best film. And I thought about the amount of work that goes into creating a shot or even a scene, and then to just cut it for the benefit of the film really allowed me to move forward as a sound designer where now I see the film and I understand that it was an emotional moment. The sounds were all too mechanical and as flavoursome as they were and as hard work as they were to develop, we needed them there as options, but they weren't the finished film. And what works now is something that's quite beautiful and I think has moved a lot of people, including myself.